we 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 are, we we see your your slide. Okay. Yeah, I got to squeeze. Yeah. I just getting rid of the, the the zoom so I can see my slides. Okay. Great. Well, uh, good morning. So um, I think it's still so, there. <laughs> yeah. Go. Okay. So so um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. So welcome to the heliophysics and space geophysics seminars promoted by the Brazilian National Institute for Space Research (INPE). Uh, in particular, this uh, seminar is hosted by the Space Geophysics Postgraduate Program at INPI and, uh, uh, and the project called the Research in Heliophysics funded by CAPES Funding Agency. Uh, our guest today is Dr. <coughs> Ian Richardson from the University of Maryland and NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Dr. Richardson obtained his PhD in cosmic ray and space physics from Imperial College London he has been working at the Goddard Space Flight Center uh, under University of Maryland and GSFC Cooperative Agreement since 1988. Currently, he's an uh, associate research scientist at the University of Maryland College Park. Uh, his research uh, focuses on studying the interplanetary environment between the sun and the earth, including the structure of the solar wind, the energetic particle populations that are present and the interaction of the solar wind with the earth and comets. So on behalf of IMPI, I would like to thank Dr. Richardson for accepting our invitation to present <laughs> this uh, seminar on the topic of uh, solar wind stream interaction regions, which is a topic of central interest for our research activities at IMPI. So I'd like to ask all the audience to mute their microphones during the presentation. And uh, if you have questions for the, for the seminar, you can post the questions on the chat and we will be happy to read the questions at the end. Or if you like, you can ask your own question. Just raise your hand in the system and then we let you speak, okay? So it's all yours, Dr. Richard. So thank you very much. <coughs> okay, so yes, thanks very much for the invitation and the good morning to everybody. Um, yes, so I'm going to talk about uh, corrotating high-speed streams, sort of wind streams and stream interaction regions. Um, the movie here basically gives you the concept of the uh, high-speed streams. Here's the uh, it's a simulation of the solar wind and the um, green and the orange uh, regions here are higher speed solar wind streams that are uh, emanating from the sun, the sun's rotating, and you see they form these sort of spiral structures here. And uh, as opposed to these uh, transients that are coming out from coronal mass ejections, um, which are the other sort of main component of the solar wind. Okay. So the solar wind um, was first proposed theoretically by uh, Eugene Parker in um, 1958, and it's the supersonic expansion of the hot uh, mega Kelvin solar corona into the interplanetary space. Here's the solar corona. We've seen these solar eclipse photographs, and the corona is expanding out in all directions into the uh, into the interplanetary space. Uh, so the solar wind is flowing out radially, but because of the the sun is rotating, then the um, uh, the the uh, streamlines and the magnetic field lines are dragged out by the plasma um, are, are drag are, are, are um, take on this uh, Archimedean spiral uh, configuration. So the, the sort of the solar wind is flowing out radially, but because of the rotation of the sun, then the magnetic field lines and streamlines are the spiral structure. And at one AU, it turns out that the um, sort of corrotation speed and the radial speed of, of typical solar wind speed about 400 kilometers per second. Uh, gives you about a um, 45 degree angle with respect to the radial direction of the magnetic field lines that one of you. Um, so that was Parker's theory in 1958. And in the early 60s, the first observations were made by spacecraft of the solar wind. And um, one of the first discoveries was that um, the speed varied. This, for example, is um, the sun rotates about every 26 days. So, OK, so here's a, a time versus speed for the solar wind, and um, you see the speed isn't constant, it actually varies from about 200 kilometers per second during this period, slow to fast, slow to fast. And next 26 day period here, the sun's rotated one time, and you can see that there's some recurrence of the stream structure. The stream here appears to occur on the next rotation, and also these structures here. And you go another solar rotation, and again, you see these this high speed stream here appears to be recurring. And if you track down through, there's what, uh, five solar rotations here. And you can see this stream, high-speed stream here, tends to be recurring. And some of these other structures here. So, but also there's some appear and disappear. So these solar wind is divided into slower and faster streams. 
And some of these faster streams tend to recur for many sort of rotations. So they're long lived, but they also evolve in time as well. And <clears throat> one of the other early discoveries was that the um, solar wind speed is closely correlated with enhanced geomagnetic activity, for example, the KP index. Um, and this shows the solar wind speed here, varying in time. And here's the geomagnetic KP index, almost varying in concert with the, with the solar wind speed. And this, this then gives a, um, a clue to uh, resolving a very long-lived issue, which was back in the, 1905, then Edward Maunder noticed that uh, geomagnetic activity tends to recur at the solar rotation period. Now, this is going back well before we knew about the solar wind. We didn't even know the sun was magnetized. It was just up there sitting, burning there, and uh, we don't even know why, how it was getting energy. But for some reason, gym activity seemed to be ordered by the uh, solar rotation period. Um, this is a figure from Warner's paper. Um, this is, here is the, um, the, the uh, rotation of, this, of, the, of the sun in degrees here. And this is observations from 1882 to 1903. And there's, you notice that there are periods when the uh, higher, higher enhanced gym activity tended to recur for rotation after rotation. And you know, notice that it had nothing to do with sunspots. Um, in fact, they, these, this tended to occur when sunspots were absent. And um, he suggests that the Earth was repeatedly encountering co-rotating streams about 20 degrees wide in longitude. Um, but again, we didn't know anything about the solar wind, and we didn't know why this was occurring. Um, it's just a puzzle. So then Bartels in 1932, just to give the idea that we're making progress, so that the sources on the sun are mystery regions, M regions. So for a long time, there were these mystery regions on the sun that gave this high-speed stream, that, gave, that, that produced this, um, cur this curritating, uh, this recurrent human activity, but didn't know why. And it took about another 50 years to the, um, to the observations by the Skylab um, observing observatory. Um, some of us may remember that, um, 1973, 1974, and it made observations of the sun in soft X-rays. And one of the surprising things was that you see these very dark and stark regions here. These are called coronal holes, where there's energy released. You know, there's this less X-ray emission. There's energy released from these regions, and um, you can see that they have this. You can say they tend to be around the poles. You can't really see them to the South Pole in this image, but then there are extensions in this case up front of this coronal hole from the pole down to the uh, equator, equatorial regions. And um, so that was a totally unexpected discovery. And uh, this is just some more skylab observations. This actually just shows stills from uh, uh, the, that type of movie, just for solar, seven solar rotations here. You can see this coronal hole um, persisting for, for rotation after rotation. Here's one here, this is called the boot of Italy um, coronal hole for obvious reasons. And you can just see how they persist, but they also evolve. It also evolves uh, with time. It gradually sort of fades out here. Um, and some of the evidence that this, this is, this, this, these coronal holes are associated with high-speed streams, then this is, just shows the uh, plot of X-ray intensity and the solar wind speed uh, mapping, mapping those spirals back to the sun to determine where, they, where, this, where the high-speed flow is leaving the sun on. Uh, this is the uh, longitude here. And you can see where the uh, X-ray flux is lowest, which is the coronal hole there, then the solar wind speed leaving the sun is actually the highest. Um, so let's say it took right until 1973 before we actually discovered how that recurrent activity and these high, uh, related to features on the sun. And uh, <clears throat> just gives another, another idea about, so, so you've got a coronal hole here and you get the high-speed stream high speed flow is coming out from this coronal hole. And it turns out when you, um, you can actually measure the magnetic fields on the sun now, we know, clearly know it's magnetized, and you can actually uh, use a model to extrapolate the solar photospheric magnetic field into the corona. And it turns out the way you see these coronal holes actually tend to get open field lines, which are open to the, uh, to the solar wind versus these closed field lines that go back to the sun. So you get the idea that some energy is released, released here and the plasma can flow out easily on these open field lines, which give you this higher speed flow. 
so now we, uh, we routinely uh, measure the, the magnetic field and using this sort of plot I showed you on the previous page and also here, we can model the, use the measurements of the solar magnetic field, uh, post magnetic field to model the uh, coronal magnetic fields. There's a model here from predictive science in uh, San Diego. And you can see there are regions where the solar field, field lines are open and there are other ones where regions where the field lines are closed. And what these modelers do is actually identify the uh, regions of open field lines as coronal holes. And uh, use the map which shows the um, coronal holes here. This is uh, long latitude versus longitude on the sun. And you can see the, uh, the polar coronal holes I mentioned just now where the field lines are open up here. And uh, they have opposite polarity. This is um, outward on the northern pole in this time and inward here. And then you can see these equatorial regions, which are sometimes extensions of the polar coronal holes. And sometimes you get coronal holes, which just have seen appear in the equatorial regions, just, you know, just isolated from the polar coronal holes. So, <clears throat> and the green marks here are actually where the uh, models have actually said, if you've, you've got a, uh, if you, you're the earth and you're, um, you map your field lines back, the spirals back, and then you can actually connect is that you can indicate which coronal hole the solar wind is coming from at this particular times as you go, as, as the sun rotates and the space and the Earth or the action point goes through a, across the plot here. And sometimes you can see we can actually be connected up right up to a polar coronal hole, even though we're at the, at the Earth, at the, you know, the ecliptic. So that's the, the sources of high-speed streams. <clears throat> now, what happens when a high-speed stream goes out into the into the solar wind? Um, now, it's, it's going to have slower solar wind ahead of it, and you've got fast solar wind um, coming up behind the slow solar wind, you're going to get a compression region formed as the uh, slow and fast and slow solar wind interact. And because of the rotation, these compression regions tend to form a spiral structure. Um, down here are some signatures of the uh, typical profiles and different solar wind uh, parameters uh, around rotating interaction regions, as these are called. So here's the solar wind speed. And uh, where the solar wind uh, speed is increasing here, you get the compression region. You see an increase in the density, the magnetic field strength. There's a deflection in the flow as the two flow regimes interact, uh, tends to go uh, west and east. And there's also an increase in the temperature due to compression of the plasma as well as the, uh, the, the temperature also varies in, in solar wind anyway. The, the, the faster solar wind tends to have a higher temperature, but you get a little bit more compression and heating in, these, in the interaction region. Um, there's one other feature here. You can see the density profile here is actually denser on this side, and then it drops in the middle of the interaction region and then goes down. This is because the faster solar wind is less dense than the slow solar wind. So you get a higher density uh, on, in the leading edge of the, sea, uh, of the interaction region. And then the sudden density drop here is actually where the, inter where the slow and the fast stream um, plasma are, is, um, are, 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 are meeting each other. So it's the, what's called the stream interface here. And then you see the lower density in the, in the high-speed stream. So that interface is that in the center of the interaction region is actually an interesting feature that uh, you can often see. Um, now, because the interaction region is tending to expand into the, into the ambient solar wind, then it turns out if the, the, uh, if the expansion speed is fast enough, basically above the magnetosonic speed, then you can get a, form, a, shock, a shock formation at the, the boundaries of, this, of the interaction region. And uh, this is, it turns out this is more favorable beyond, beyond 1 AU. Um, and you get a forward shock, which, uh, which is propagating away from the sun, formed at the leading edge. And then on the trailing edge of the interaction region, you can get a reverse shock, which is actually propagating towards the sun in the frame of the solar wind. Um, so that gives you a basic uh, schematic of the interaction between slow and fast solar wind. You get these formation of these, these Archimedean spiral approximately uh, interaction regions. Um, it tend to be called co-rotating action regions, but some people like to call some 
if you only see, usually, as I mentioned before, you see these streams re recurring for several rotations, but sometimes you just see it for one rotation. And some people like to call those stream interaction regions because they're only seen once versus co-rotating interaction regions which you see many times. And some people are worried about that, that difference and some people don't. And um, you'll see the both terms used in, uh, in papers, um, CIR and SIR, but really they're sort of the same thing. That's a schematic. Here's a lot of data. I'm sorry, it's a very busy slide, but I'll just walk you through a few main points. This is um, solar wind parameters for, for one solar rotation, about 27 days I've got here. And um, we'll start with the solar wind speed here. You can see the, the, the slow and fast streams that I've already mentioned. And for each one, you'll see this is the plasma density. You'll see increase in density on the leading edge of the high speed stream. And if you go way up here to the magnetic field intensity, you'll see the increase on the, on the leading edge associated with the interaction region. Um, and here's the temperature again, showing the profile with the higher temperatures in the, in the solar wind speed, in the, in the higher speed stream. Um, you can see the interaction region, the uh, in stream interface quite nicely in some of these interaction regions. For example, um, this is probably the best one. You can see the high density going down to low density. And um, again, here, the density is dropping down, the temperature is going up, the speed's going up. That's really the boundary between the slow cell wind and the fast cell wind. And again, here, the density drops less, less clear in this one. <coughs> um, another feature you can see here is the, um, this is the direction of the, um, the Apparently, magnetic field in the azimuthal direction. So this is um, where it's directed outward from the sun. Check out here, outward from the sun, or going inward towards the sun. And you see, it tends to have you know one direction or the other. Um, and each stream tends to have one polarity, which uh, is determined by the polarity at under in the in the, in the photosphere underlying the the source coronal hole. So you see this this one. Here has outward polarity, and this one has an inward polarity. Because they're coming from two different coronal holes. And this one here has outward polarity. <coughs> and you might notice that the uh, polarity is actually change, tends to change just before the interaction region, or actually just inside the interaction region. And I'll explain why that is in a minute, but it's quite a common feature. Um, there's some other things of interest here. This is the cosmic ray, galactic cosmic ray intensity. Um, He's down here measured by, um, this is actually measured by the impact spacecraft, and this is by a neutral monitor, CD neutral monitor. You can see that the uh, cosmic ray intensity tends to be depressed in the high speed streams. Um, it's almost a sort of mirror image of the solar wind speed. You can think of actually the, hard, the faster solar wind is actually sort of sweeping out the cosmic rays at some level. Um, and finally, down here, this is a uh, composite. This tells us something about the composition of the solar wind. This is uh, observations from the ACE spacecraft. It's the, the abundance ratio of, of, of uh, solar wind ions with uh, oxygen ions with charge seven and charge six. And you can see that particularly here, you can see that the uh, O7 to O6 ratio is higher in the solar wind and drops as you go across the interface into the slow solar wind. And it's a similar feature here. So the slow and fast solar wind actually have Quite different uh, charge state abundances and also composition, which I'm not showing here. Um, so there are fun two sort of two fundamentally different states of the solar wind. Um, you can see the you can really see their transition as you go through the interaction region here. And I mentioned that the um, that those um, changes in the solar wind magnetic field direction tend to occur just before the interaction region. This is because the um, the uh, the change in magnetic field from one polarity in one in the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere tends to occur across a heliospheric current sheet, which is sort of at least at solar minimum where things are very nice and simple. It's sort of like a ballerina skirt that surrounds the sun above the um, so equatorial regions. And as the uh, interaction region um, is, uh, expands in the, into the slow solar wind, then this this um, current sheet tends to get pulled into the into the interaction region, and so we can emerge in the actual interaction region. 
So that's why it tends to occur just before, or just inside the, the CIR. Um, there's one question is actually, uh, how do the CIRs uh, develop with radial distance? And um, as I mentioned earlier, the, we only discovered in the, in the around about 1974 that the uh, coronal holes are actually the source of, of um, high speed streams. So there was actually a spacecraft, there's two spacecraft actually, Helios spacecraft launched into the, in, the 19, in the mid 1970s, and they went right into 0.31 AU from the sun. And one of their uh, ejectors was trying to understand what is the source of the, of, of the slow and fast solar wind. Um, but of course, Skylab also discovered say coronal holes at about the same time. But what they noticed is um, that this is the uh, these are, this is the solar wind speed. Um, the leading, uh, and I'm just focusing on the leading edge of the streams. Uh, this stream here, which recurs um, several times here, and the spacecraft is seen as observed by the spacecraft as the spacecraft gets closer to the sun. So here's the uh, speed gradient on the leading edge here, and you can sort of see as you get closer to the sun then the speed gradient between slow and fast solar wind actually steepens as you get closer to the sun. And um, this is sort of consistent with the idea that those coronal holes are sort of a, a sharp, fairly sharp division between the slow and fast solar wind sources on the sun. But at the time uh, before coronal holes were discovered, then there was some argument about whether the, um, the transitions between slow and fast solar wind at the sun are actually smooth and then they steepen because of the dynamical processes in the solar wind, or whether they're actually sharp at the sun, and then they tend to uh, evolve as the, uh, as, the, as the interaction region moves, is, uh, goes, goes further from the sun. So that's Helios observations in the inner heliosphere. Um, of course, Parker, Spiral, Parker Solar Probe is, is making very close observations of the sun now, and I'll get back to that later. Um, this is one other Helios observation is that uh, this, there are two Helios spacecraft and they um, sometimes they're at the same latitude and other times they're at different latitudes, like different latitudes. And one sort of straight interesting uh, observation was that, okay, this is the solar wind speed versus time again, oh, gee, um, longitude on the sun and observations from the two Helios spacecraft. And you can see here where they're very close together in latitude, then the profiles are very similar. But as they start to separate in latitude, even by just a few degrees, then the uh, solar wind speed profiles um, uh, change quite significantly, which indicates that there is a quite significant latitudinal uh, structure in the solar wind as well in the heliosphere. And of course, this is what uh, Solar Orbiter is designed to uh, study. Um, I guess the Solar Orbiter a bit later, but it goes to higher latitudes, and uh, so we can actually study the longitudinal, the latitudinal variation in the high speed streams. Okay, that was going towards the sun. Let's go further out. <coughs> Excuse me, further away from the sun outside the uh, orbit of Earth. So, um, back in the, um, a, lot of, a lot of work was done in this in the 1970s. Back in the 70s, the Pioneer 10 and 11 spacecraft went out to, um, towards Jupiter. And uh, it's doing so, they, they, they actually saw these corrotating direct regions and discovered the uh, formation of these shocks. Remember the uh, forward and reverse shocks that tend to form on the uh, on the boundaries interaction regions. So here's some observations of the forward and the reverse shock. Reverse shock is um, a forward shock has a increase in speed and density and uh, field intensity here, and the reverse shock has this increase in speed, but speed but a drop in the in the magnetic field intensity. Um, and this just shows how the uh, sort of smooth transition in the solar wind speed at the Earth is is transformed into these forward and reverse shocks when you get out to civil AU. Um, this is also a model showing the same idea. Um, and these are actually observations of the same, same uh, high-speed stream at uh, the Earth, the speed profile. And you get out to 4 AU, then you've got this, this very different profile. This, the, you get the shocks formed. And also the speed has dropped. The peak speed has dropped considerably because the expansion of the... Uh, of the CIR tends to erode the, um, the speed difference because it's it's always pro it's propagating into the high speed flow, and that reduces the peak of the of the of the high speed flow. So eventually you get a a much uh, flatter speed uh, speed profile. 
it just shows uh, again lots of data, but um, it just shows the the same CIR at uh, one AU, three point eight AU, and five point two AU. Um, we we'll go through all this data, but you can see the speed profile at one AU is sort of fairly uh, gradual here, and you get to three point eight AU, you can see the formation of the shocks. Actually, you can see the stream interface still in the middle there, and at five. Point two AU again. You can see the four reverse shocks, but you can see very clearly how the stream profile is eroded as the CR gets bigger and the reverse shock here is, is climbing further and further into the high-speed stream. And if you go way, way out, um, this is some void drop observations, fourteen point three AU. Um, you can still see the vestiges of the uh, the stream structure in here, and there's some couple of density enhancement. This is a couple of cellar rotations. Um, this density uh, enhancement keeps is sort of co-rotating um, field enhancement, but you get away out to uh, 36 AU. See the speed profile is but it's virtually flat now. The the, the um, these high speed streams are eroded away, but you can still see some structures in the density and the temperature and so on. The other plasma parameters, um, and in fact, you can track some of the co-rotational features way way out into the into the outer heliosphere. Another view of high-speed streams was um, used by the uh, Ulysses spacecraft. Um, this was launched in 1990, and it went out to uh, Jupiter. I mean, it flew over the North Pole of Jupiter, which slung it into an orbit, going per essentially perpendicular to the to the ecliptic. And it did nearly three orbits during its mission. So this gives you a sort of three-dimensional view of the uh, of the Heliosphere and the solar wind structures. And this is a famous plot by Makomas et al. showing the um, solar wind speed profiles during the, uh, the, th the three uh, orbits of Ulysses around the sun. It took about five years. So this is the solar wind speed plotted in a polar um, uh, coordinate scheme um, and showing the high speed flows which tend to occur over the poles I already mentioned they come from tend to come from the height from the coronal holes the coronal holes at the poles and sure enough you can, we see high speed flows over the poles this is at solar minimum this first orbit um, you get a nice organization of fast flows over the poles and then at um, lower latitudes you tend to see a, a slower solar wind flow when you're over the uh, equatorial regions it's called the streamer belt here's the streamer sticking sticking out um, the second orbit was at solar maximum. There's lots more transients. You get a very, very uh, messy flow, um, very little order. And you can also see the corona is much more structured with lots of streamers here. Um, then the third orbit was back at uh, solar minimum. And again, you get this uh, nice structure of the, of the high speed flows over the, uh, over, the pole, over, the, over the poles and the slower speed are near the equator. But when you're when you're at low latitudes, you tend to go in and out of the um, the boundaries of the coronal holes. You know, as I showed earlier on, the you know, the coronal holes isn't just uh, over the poles; it can extend down to the equator. And uh, and you can see the uh, as you're going in and out of these high speed streams. And I'll show you more of that in a minute. One other thing to note, of course, is the magnetic field clarity is reversed. Um, the red and the blue are the, are the um, direction of the magnetic field. You can see that's reversed from one solar minimum to the next. As the solar magnetic field is reversed. So this just shows Ulysses observations as um, it's moving from the ecliptic out to high sort of south of latitude. So you can see the solar wind speed here. It's low at the equator, high at uh, high latitudes. And then you can see so basically it's going in and out of the high edge of the, the coronal hole as it gets higher and higher in latitude. So eventually it's in the high speed flow. And each time you get an interaction region, is the, is the magnetic field intensity and the density. You can see the, the um, increases in the density of the magnetic field on the leading edge of each uh, high-speed stream here. And um, this just shows different um, sorts of configuration you can get. This is a um, high-speed flow over the poles and then a low-speed flow in the equatorial regions, and you can get a um, CIR a compression formed on the leading edge of this high speed stream, and it's your rare fraction on the other side. And then as the sun's rotating another um, 180 degrees, you get the compression from this southern coronal hole. Um, 
but you can also get uh, Pretoria coronal holes sitting there isolated, and you can get pressure on the leading edge here, rear fraction on the trailing edge. Or well, this is a um, extension of the sort of polar coronal hole. You get see a compression formed on the leading edges of these extensions. So different combinations of um, uh, configurations of interaction regions you can get depending on the coronal hole configurations, and um, they turn out to have different orientations in, um, in, 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 in the north south direction. Ulysses was able to actually uh, measure some of these uh, tilts in the CIR orientations. Um, for the, uh, caused by the different um, coronal hole configurations. So it turns out, one of the interesting features, at least my point of view, is uh, someone who's interested in energetic particles is actually that uh, um, co-rotating streams can actually accelerate and uh, can accelerate energetic particles. Um, of course, most this is shows the solar wind speed and then the flux of energetic particles from um, this room page. I can't remember. You can see the the um, Intensity of particle, the particle intensity varies with time, and most of these uh, increases are due to solar flares and coronal mass ejections on the sun. <coughs> but there's some interesting uh, enhancements here, which actually don't seem to be associated with um, solar activity, and they tend to occur at the solar rotation period, and they tend to be within the high-speed streams. And um, when these were first discovered, the, the idea was sort of obvious: well, you've got open fields on the sun, letting the high speeds flow out. Therefore, these must be solar particles that are you know, left over from these um, big particle events. They're just sort of stored on the sun, and then they just drizzle. They just leak out along the open field lines that are you know, predominantly, in, and hence they're seen in the high-speed flows. Um, so that idea lasted for many years until, um, as I say, back in the 1970s, we had the Helios spacecraft, and the this is radio distance versus particle intensity. We had observations from the Helios spacecraft spacecraft at Earth, including IMP. And then there was a Pioneer 1011 spacecraft out at several AU. And um, what we realized was that if you looked at the same, looked at these particle events and seen the high speed streams at different radial distances, then it turned out that they were actually less intense in the Eden heliosphere near the sun. And they were most intense at several AU where those uh, co-rotating shocks were formed. And um, so this really demonstrates that the sun is not a source of these uh, recurring particles, but they're accelerated in, in, in interplanetary space, beyond the typically beyond the orbit of Earth. And um, I already mentioned the shocks um, that are formed at CIR boundaries. Now we know from many observations that shocks accelerate particles. Um, <clears throat> it's a well-known phenomenon. So sure enough, we've got shocks here and we actually see Inject particles accelerated around these shocks. This is from Pioneer 11 at um, several AU. I can't see what distance is here. Um, you see the particle intensity tends to be um, tends to be double peaked, and the two peaks tend to be ordered around the uh, the forward and reverse shocks of the CIR. It's another case again, got double peak, and the um, the, the, the trailing edge peak uh, tends to actually be uh, a bit more intense generally, not necessarily in that case, but has been more intense, it actually has a different um, comp uh, composition. This is the helium to proton abundance, um, tends to be higher in the, um, it's the, it's the proton, oh, I've this wrongly. <laughs> okay, it's, yes, it's, it's, there's more helium in the uh, in the, the reverse shock event than the forward shock event, um, which is actually, is, is, is actually an indication of the source of these particles, whether it's the source that they're accelerated from. Um, so, so the idea then is that uh, you can trace these particles that are um, observed that are observed in the uh, outer heliosphere, say at several AU. You can then trace the spiral structures back to this is binary down at four, and then you go right back to the to the uh, to one AU, and you can actually map the um, you can actually see the corresponding uh, uh, enhancements that are seen at Earth. Um, unfortunately, the people who wrote this paper actually did didn't quite do it right. For some reason, they map it back to the solar events here, which sort of doesn't quite fit with the picture. Um, but if I check this, they, they actually should go back to these events here. These are actually the co-rotating events uh, that are generated by the, uh, that originated these uh, CIR shocks uh, beyond uh, one EU. <coughs> so the idea is, yeah, you've got these shocks in the outer hemisphere and then the particles um, 
they, they, they flow back towards the sun. And um, further evidence says this is uh, um, these are actually particle events I, I studied years ago. And actually, I, I, you can on the IC3 spacecraft, it was spinning, and you actually could measure the number of particles that were coming into the detectors in different directions. And um, this actually, the, 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 the anisotropy here tells me actually these particles are coming towards the sun from the magnetic field direction. So all these particles here are, are coming in towards the sun from the high speed, from the um, shocks in the outer heliosphere. But there's actually a problem in that picture because um, they're actually, um, as the particles come in from the outer heat sphere, they should lose energy because they're sort of fighting against the outflowing solar wind. So these very low energy particles actually will uh, lose energy and the spectra you should get is something like, this is the intensity of the particles versus energy. Um, it should actually turn down at low energies, um, particularly if the source is very, very far away from the many, many AU from the, from the Earth. You should have this turn down at low energies. You shouldn't see these low energy particles. Um, but in fact, you do. That's actually one of my thesis results. You can see these CIR associated particles right down to tens of kb. And according to the theory, you, you should never get them from those shocks. So the idea then is that uh, there's actually local acceleration in the CIR close, you know, close to the spacecraft, um, which also contributes. So this is, for example, a, some observations from stereo. Here's the CIR. You can see the speed increase here and the compression region. And you see there are particles here from you know, right down to 97 kV per nucleon. Uh, very clear uh, enhancement associated with the CIR. Um, so it's very clearly uh, particle acceleration inside CIR is very local to the spacecraft, but the exact mechanism for that is uh, still under debate, I would say. Um, so a bit more on particles. Yeah, I showed this earlier on, sort of the idea that the uh, Covidane streams modulate uh, galactic cosmic ray intensity. Um, this actually shows observations from three spacecraft, Helios 1 and 2 and Earth, um, back in 1976. Maybe focus on Helios 2. Um, this is the solar wind speed. And this is the, the galactic cosmic ray intensity observed at the spacecraft. And you can see how actually the, it's almost like a mirror image between the solar wind speed and the uh, uh, inverse mirror image between the solar wind speed and the galactic cosmic ray intensity. Rays clearly see how the fast streams will sweep out the cosmic rays. And, um, okay. Oops, sorry. So let's go to geomagnetic activity again where I started. Um, this just shows the um, two rotations, two solar rotations worth of, of data, solar wind uh, parameters, and also some um, geomagnetic activity uh, indices down the bottom here. This shows a period in 2003 where there are nice solar wind stream structures here. You can see the CIRs again. And you can see the AA index, geomagnetic index KP, um, very nicely correlated with the solar wind speed which I showed very early on in the talk. And then DST, which is uh, inverse, got stronger as negative. So that also is going along here. So you can see very nicely how the high speed streams modulate the, uh, the um, Sorry, the, the uh, geomagnetic activity here. This is a read period in 2009. And you see the stream structure is very weak. The solar wind speed is very few, very small changes in the, in the uh, speed, no high speed streams. So you can see actually see, see a couple of CIRs, even though the speed is quite slow, it's still actually interaction. Uh, geomagnetic indices you can see are much weaker, much quieter. Um, than over here. So a very nice demonstration of how the streams, streams uh, modulate the, um, the, the geomagnetic activity. So you, you think from that figure that the speed is actually the, what's actually called, uh, modulating the activity, but actually it's a bit more subtle than that. The, um, <clears throat> what happens is that the um, high-speed streams actually have alphanic fluctuations coming away from the sun. The, the field is never, it's always, it's always fluctuating on timescales of say an hour or so, um, it's, it's, it's fluctuating around in direction and occasionally the, the magnetic field will go south. And when it goes south, then you tend to get enhanced human activity. I'll explain that why that is in a second. So here's this high-speed stream and here's the uh, north-south component of the magnetic field, which is randomly sort of going up and down. 
the Kojia goes south, and um, in fact, the um, BB set is actually, a, in some ways, a more important parameter. Um, it's an electric field. Um, and you can see AE increases every each time that the field goes south. So it's not just the high speed stream, it's actually the fluctuations, magnetic field fluctuations in the high speed stream, which uh, produce this uh, Hudson activity. And because the solar wind speed can last for many days, then the AE, uh, for example, activity here um, can last for many, many days. And um, these are often called Hilker events, high intensity, long duration, continuous AE activity. So why is uh, V South important? Um, just a quick reminder that uh, when the, south, the um, solar wind magnetic field is, has a southward component, it's in the opposite direction to the uh, Earth's magnetic field on the day side here. And you can get reconnection forming at the leading edge of the day side and field lines get dragged over into the pole, into the tail. Energy is stored in the, in the magnetosphere and that sort of leads to reactivity. That's some sort of one sentence or so uh, explanation for why uh, the southward field is important for GM activity. So <clears throat> another interesting point is actually looking at the, uh, the variation of the influence of um, co-rotating streams and uh, coronal mass ejection, uh, CME-related storm. C CMEs can also, uh, coronal mass ejection uh, can also produce uh, st storms when the, uh, uh, the CME, the infantry CME uh, passes the, uh, the Earth. So there are actually sort of two, two main drivers of geomatic storms. Um, so we're focusing here on the co-rotating stream. So this just shows several uh, solar, wind, solar activity cycles here of data. And I just counted up the number of um, day, actually days when storm conditions were, um, were, 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 were experienced um, each year. Um, I divided the storms into different sizes here, the criteria over here based on, some, on KP by some criteria for Gosling uh, came up with a few years ago. Uh, they're all over here, I won't go through all the details, but um, <clears throat> so this is the number of storm days actually per year uh, caused by um, CMEs and also co-rotating streams. So focusing on the co-rotating streams, you can see that the set of small streams, small events, small storms, they tend to be um, occur prominent, predominantly on the trading edge of the solar cycle, where actually the high-speed streams tend to be well-developed. Um, as for small, so small storms, you got the larger storms, you can see going right back here that there are actually very few large storms caused by uh, co-rotating streams. The bigger, big, big storms tend to be caused by CMEs and they follow the um, solar activity cycle. And then in the middle, the some medium sized storms tend to be contributed by um, high speed streams on the trading edge of the solar cycle and also by the uh, by CMEs in the, in the uh, maximum of the cycle. Um, it's actually an interesting point here that actually, in, particularly it's clear in solar cycle 21, actually the, the minimum uh, activity is actually the solar maximum. The sun, the, the sun can be actually quiet at, right at solar maximum as the solar field is reversing. Let me see it again here. Um, so actually you still got three peaks in, in the geom activity. You've got a sort of peak here, two peaks here contributed by the um, CMEs, and then you get this third peak uh, contributed by the, um, by the high speed streams. So if you just look at the number of storms, you'll see these two, 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 two peaks here tend to merge into each other. Um, so often uh, activities can characterize as double peak per cycle, but actually it may be three peaks if you divide it up this way. You get the same sort of thing here. So, so in summary, sort of protein streams can produce um, small to medium sized storms on, predominantly on the trading edge of the solar cycle. Um, <clears throat> although I've talked about, you know, these streams tend to be sort of um, long-lived and you know, co-rotate for many rotations, they do actually, there is actually some, some development and structure into them, in them. Um, this is actually the same CIR and stream observed by three closely spaced space spacecraft, the stereo, the stereos and wind, and they were 25 degrees apart in longitude, so they were quite close really in terms of the heliosphere. Um, it just shows the solar wind parameters and um, I'm going into details, but you can probably just just glancing at the figures see that they, they there is some development. For example, the high the, the um, speed here and stereo A and wind 
and stereo, sorry, sorry, stereo B wind and stereo A. Can you see there is actually some development or evolution, or maybe you're going through the structure in a slightly different path, the three spacecraft. So they're not, the CIR is not totally identical at the, each, each location. And again, you see the density here, there's a big density spike here, which doesn't seem to be seen in the other spacecraft. So along these structures, there is clearly some uh, evolution or, or, or some terms and change in at least in the observations of the uh, CIR, even over fairly uh, small distances. And some of that can be the, you know, these are actually, long latitude can be a factor, but these are actually the same latitude, roughly. Um, okay, I just sort of shown in situ uh, observations of the solar wind, but actually there are, there are other ways of studying the solar wind and the high speed streams, which may be of interest. One is to use um, interplanetary scintillation observations. Uh, the idea here is you've got a, 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 a astronomical source of, of light, which may be a, you know, a star or whatever, but the light's got to come to the Earth, come through the solar wind. And it turns out the density fluctuations in the solar wind cause the light, uh, the intensity of the light to flicker and scintillate. Actually, the, the radio sources rather than light, yeah. And so you've got two, observ two observatories on the, on the Earth. They, they can, they'll see the, um, they measure the intensity as a function of time. There'll be a slight shift as um, as the, um, the solar wind moves across the the field of view of the two, two, two the two observatories, and you can actually work out the uh, do a correlation, actually work out what the speed of the solar wind is across the um, across the plane of the sky there, and also get the density. So, what? Um, particularly Bernie Jackson down at um, at um, in, in, um, California is actually um, you, used to, the idea of cat, uh, top tomography, which we use for CAT scans for um, X-rays and so on. Um, the idea is to get a, to build up a three-dimensional picture of the um, of the solar wind using these line of sight uh, IPS observations. And so this is just sort of a, 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 a um, visualization. It's actually a movie, but I've just got some frames here of the of the solar wind speed based on these uh, IPS observations. And you can sort of see the uh, the stream structure here, and uh, this is say in the movie, so you can actually see the streams actually corrugating around the sun in these movies. They're quite fascinating. Um, but I said they're all based on this IPS um, observations. That's one way of looking at the solar wind in a different way. And um, another way that um, solar wind studies you are, are involved is, is another way of um, studying solar wind is actually to do do modern do some modeling. Um, there are various different models that are used to do this. Um, they tend to use based on, I'm going to, they tend to be based on magnetic field observations from the sun. And um, this is one that's called the uh, WSA inner model, which may be familiar to many of you. So this is the uh, solar wind speed that's observed. And this is the simulated speed from the model, the function of time. And the idea of this study here is actually to compare the, um, Compared to observed and the predicted um, speeds and other parameters as a function of time, and uh, try and improve the models. Um, and there's actually different models that were studied in, in, in this in this paper, and um, it turned out that actually the the best predictions of of um, high speed streams are actually based on persistence. In other words, um, you assume what's going to happen tomorrow is the same as today or you assume that what's going to happen in 27 days time is the same as today because of the rotation of the sun. So actually the model, they're the best models in terms of predicting what the solar wind will be uh, uh, versus the various uh, models that have been produced here. But anyhow, I hope there'll be some improvements in that. Okay. So I mentioned Parker Solar Probe. Parker Solar Probe is, um, is um, as I'm sure you're aware, a um, mission to touch the sun as they like to say. Uh, it's going very close to the sun, got a big heat shield on it, and um, it's uh, doing pretty well. So far, it's launched in August 19, 2018, and um, this is actually data from the first orbit of the of around the sun. It went right into uh, 0.61 AU, so far closer to the sun than the Helios spacecraft. Um, this is just a summary of all the solar wind parameters through the, uh, 
the um, first pass is the radial distance. You can see the, for example, the magnetic field intensity getting stronger as the, as the, as the spacecraft approaches the sun and then falling again. Uh, and likewise, the solar wind pressure density. Anyhow, the, um, so there are some um, solar wind high speed streams bedded in this data. They're supposed to be here where the gray, gray curves are. Um, the gray, the gray shading is, there's one there, I guess. Another one there. Another one there. I think I think actually it's the, the CIR they're actually indicating something that the, the main stream is actually there, another one there. Um, so Parker is seeing CIRs. Um, I, um, they're, they're still writing the papers and so on. So I haven't got and I'm not really involved in it. So I can't really give any spectacular new results in that. But anyhow, there is actually one interesting feature here. This is the uh, oh, this, is, this is one with representation of the data. You can see the the, this is the different colors are the, the solar wind speed here, and the red is the fast stream. So this actually shows the sort of configuration of the, um, the spirals that uh, representing the high speed flows. This is totally unrealistic because, the, as I mentioned, you don't get, this doesn't take into, in, into account the interactions. All these spirals are plotted over each other. There should be interactions, of course, but it gives you an idea of where the high speed flows are that Parker is seeing. And one interesting feature of Parker is that during this orbit for a short period here, it's actually um, rotating in opposite. It's um, its speed is so high that in fact it's actually staying. It's actually going backwards in longitude on the sun relative to the normal uh, situation. So actually, one stream is seen here, and I think it's um, let's see where are we? This one here, and you know, so most of the streams I've shown you, well, all the streams I've shown you have have a have a rapid rise on the leading edge. And then a decay, but this one here actually has a, a sort of slow rise and a rapid drop, and I think that's because the, um, the Parker is actually going moving the opposite direction um, during this period here, and it's seeing it's it's transverse it's, it's going across the stream stream in the wrong direction as it were. So I mean, certainly Parker is giving us some new observations of CNRs. This is actually one paper that's been comparing a uh, CIR stream seen by, by Parker and also a stereo. And this is the solar wind speed and density and so on. And you see one problem, unfortunately, is that Parker has these gaps. And you can clearly see the stream there and make some comparisons. They've actually scaled the observations by these factors here. Um, so Parker's clearly seen the same stream, but because of the gaps in the Parker observations, it's a bit hard to actually make any definitive Inclusions about you know comparing these two streams. Um, there's some particles shown down here. This is a representation of the particles seen at stereo, and there's actually also seen some um, particles seen in associated with the CIR by the Epi Low instrument on Parker. Um, this is actually some particle spectra at stereo, which is at one AU, and also at Parker, and you can see that the intensity is lower. Parker than stereo, which goes along with what I was, the, the heaps observations I was discussing earlier on, where the intensity of the CIR associated particles tends to drop as you go further closer to the sun. And finally, um, Solar Orbiter uh, again, it's just um, it was launched last year. Um, the first of you know, first papers on the first observations are coming out. This is actually a figure from one of them. Um, <coughs> this shows a un unfortunately the um, Plasma experiment on, on, on solar orbiters had some issues. I wasn't working at the time these observations, but this shows some energetic particle observations. I won't go through all the details, but uh, here's, this, here's, the, um, here's the magnetic field intensity. Um, they had to use the radio instrument to get a density out. That's the way of doing that. Here's the density, and here's a, a, a rough idea of the solar wind speed, again, from the radio observations. Again, I'm, I'm going to why they, how they get that, but... Um, so there's an indication this is a CIR, and um, here's some particle enhancement associated with the CIR. And the people who wrote the paper actually noticed that it's actually very like one I published based on my thesis years ago. Um, it's a 1979 event. Here's the, uh, here's the solar wind speed, the CIR, and what I see is a, is a in, in, increase of lone ions inside the CIR, and then there's the a very a different population 
seen in a high speed stream, it turns out these are the particles that are flowing towards the sun from the reverse shock, it looks like. But there's a separate population here in the CIR, which appears to be accelerated locally. And that's sort of similar picture you have here. There's an increase here in the CIR, and then there's this other population here, um, which is flowing towards the sun. So anyway, again, so all the two, it's just first results there, and hopefully we'll provide lots of new information on the uh, structure of the solar wind streams in the inner heliosphere. Um, there's a whole load of, maybe I won't go through all these questions. <laughs> Yeah, so there's still a lot of questions about um, about um, CIRs and high-speed streams, particularly what's the latitudinal structure, which hopefully Solar Orbital will provide information on, uh, the variability on different spatial and time scales. Um, there's actually interesting features that um, I mentioned the uh, current sheet, and in fact, there's some indication that actually transient structures can come out along the current sheet and make, so you've got a transient you might have a transient component in these long-lived um, high-speed uh, CIRs. Um, so radial rotate, radial evolution, um, particle acceleration is some big issues there. Um, why is why are cosmic rays modulated by high-speed streams? There's still some outstanding issues there. Um, uh, yeah, I'm going through all these. Things. Okay. Anyhow, I, I gave this talk originally at uh, the um, meeting in Argentina um, at the time of the July 2nd, 1990 eclipse. So that's just a picture of the eclipse uh, they took. And um, so thank you. And also this is, uh, the talk is based on a, a living review paper on the topic, which I um, given the, the reference down here at the bottom. Um, so feel free to, to read, check that out and see, learn a lot more about uh, interactive regions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Richard Song. It was excellent uh, presentation. And uh, uh, I was there at this eclipse and uh, it was amazing. It was a pity we, we missed the, the one last year on, on December. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. So we have a few questions at the chat. Uh, I will uh, go on and read them. Just, just one second. Uh, yeah. Okay, so first question is from Stella Santos, is one of our doctoral students, and she is asking how is it possible to identify that the coronal hole and, and the structure on different rotations come from the same coronal hole? So, ah, so she wants to know how do you correlate one rotation with the other regarding the coronal hole? And uh, do the sector position of high, high uh, heliospheric current sheet change with the solar cycle? And uh, how is possible to identify forward and reverse shocks on the interplanetary data? Do shocks occur within one AU? Several questions here. <laughs> Lots of questions. Okay. Um, what's the first one? <laughs> I just forgot the first one was that. Um, I'll ask that. I'll ask, I'll ask, oh, that's right. Yes. How do you, how do you find the source of coronal holes? Um, the very simplest way is to uh, just, I mentioned the, the spiral structure, so you can actually uh, map the spiral structure from the spacecraft back to the, um, to the sun, basically, and that gives you an idea of where the, where the solar wind is originating on the sun. Um, that's a sort of simple way to do it. Um, and also another way you can actually do is also look at the, um, the, the polarity of the solar wind in the high speed flow. And, I mentioned those uh, photospheric magnetic field maps. So you want to just make sure that your um, the polarity of your of the solar wind in the in the coronal hole flow in the high speed flow matches the uh, magnetic field that's underneath the um, underneath the um, the coronal hole of the sun. To make sure they match up. Um, if they don't, then you've you've got another source there somewhere. <laughs> um, so the second the other one was um, about identifying four reverse shocks in the solar wind. Um, yeah, forward shock tends to have increases in the, well, has increases in the solar wind speed, density, temperature, and magnetic field intensity. But a reverse shock, um, let's see, that has an increase in the speed, a drop in, but a drop in the other parameters. Um, has a um, drop in the in magnetic field density and temperature. Um, because the shock is traveling towards the sun, then you, um, in the frame of the solar wind, then you, you're you actually going, as you go past 
as it goes past you, you're going from the, the region behind the shock, as it were, into the upstream region ahead of the shock. So it's the reverse situation for a forward shock. Um, you can there are plenty of papers on that, and you can say look up, look up my paper, and you'll you'll see some references to to other papers that discuss that. Um, third one was the uh, or second one actually was the hemispheric um, plasma machine. Does it change with a solar cycle? I think that was the question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's uh, the, the, the 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 structure of the plasma sheet is actually very simple at solar minimum, where you've got um, basically. Uh, yeah, got it. Uh, but, but when you, but, as I was just showing here recently, but when you at sort of maximum, it gets more, much more complicated and it's, it's highly inclined to the ecliptic and and it's sometimes it's not even clear. It's there is really a strong a, a, a full uh, passage sheet. Um, so there is some structure, uh, some very evolution during the solar, during the um, solar cycle. And um, but of course, I, sp I never really go into this very much. I did. High speed flows tend to be the correcting flows tend to be less dominant at uh, solar win a uh, solar maximum than at solar minimum. Um, I hope that answers the questions. <laughs> I, I think she also asks whether the shocks occur within one AU. I yes. think she refers to reverse shocks. Yeah, um, yeah, come on, I, I, correcting shocks in general. I, I, they they they're rare at one AU. I've got what the it's in the paper. I can't, it's, it's, it's only a few percent, as I recall, of CIRs have shocks at one of you, but they do occur at one of you. They're more frequently on the other speed area. And there are some, I believe there are very occasional ones seen at Helios, but um, inside one of you. But um, yeah, they're, 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 so they are seen at one of you, yeah. But really. So, well, the next question is uh, from myself. I, I wanted to know whether there is a threshold, a speed threshold limit for defining a high speed stream. Uh, you mentioned in the early slides 600 kilometers per second, but I have the feeling that uh, they are getting slower in the last uh, solar cycle. So yeah. is that the correct impression or, or it doesn't make any sense? That's actually an interesting um, observation. Yes, you, you will get people to say, oh, it's got to be above a certain threshold. But I, I, I tend to agree with your observation. There are some, I actually showed that in the figure with um, so I can find it actually uh, the, the the low low uh, gym activity. Where I'll... yeah, this one here, you can see these. The, the, it, it, you're barely going above 400 kilometers per second, but it's very clearly a CIR here. It has all the features. It has the densities going up, fields going up. There's a temperature increase. Um, the um, crunch is a bit further ahead, and uh, you might even say maybe there's even one there. or well, certainly here. See the temperatures going up. Looks like that's sort of like a coronal hole flow, but just the speed is much slower. And I, I, I tend to agree. I think I think it's hard to define a, a minimum or a, or a threshold on that. Uh, a lot of people do, but I think it's more subtle. And I've, I've heard other people who see these very slow flows and they call them uh, alphanic slow flows. But I think they're they're um, they're actually maybe you're just going through the boundary of a of the coronal hole, or or just Maybe it's sometimes the flow is really slow. I'm not really sure about that. Um, Thank you. So uh, another question from Marlos, one of our colleagues at INPE, he's asking, is it possible to infer high-speed streams characteristics at one AU based on the characteristics of the coronal holes, uh, such as size and position, for example? So he wants to know uh, that we can uh, guess things in at one AU from what we see on solar images. Yes, and uh, yes, that's interesting. And that, that's, that's actually how these this modeling is done. Um, I, it's not actually from images, it's actually from magnetic field um, observations. This gong is a, uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a magnetic, it's a, it's a um, series of observatories around the, around the earth that measure the sun, measure magnetic fields on the sun, and they build up a, um, a map of the, of the solar magnetic field. And, um, it turns, and so then I mentioned earlier on, you can actually use the mapping, use some modeling to indicate, to infer where the open field regions are in the sun, where the coronal holes are. And it turns out there's a relationship between the expansion rate of the magnetic field and the, and the solar wind speed. In fact, this is um, WSA here is Wang Shidi Arji, which is a model that's uh, empirical model that, that 
it uses the expansion rate of the magnetic fields to actually infer the, the, the solar wind speed. Um, so yes, that, that's a, so that's a, that, so in fact you are using solar observations to infer the, 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 the solar wind speed. Yeah. Thank you. So another question from a doctoral student, Daniele Medeiros from our institute. She is uh, referring to a plot of the solar wind uh, with a reverse shock at low latitude. And uh, uh, she asks whether the speed change to high latitudes and uh, also why does, uh, why is there an abrupt change in oxygen seven to oxygen six? Uh, it's a very good question. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, um, the second one actually is interesting. Uh, why is there a change? Uh, in fact, it's, um, um, you then go down to the theory of what's producing the slow solar wind and the fast solar wind. We know the, slow, the fast solar wind is coming from coronal holes, but the source of the slow solar wind is actually a lot less clearer. And um, so one idea is that um, the slow solar wind is actually coming from um, uh, closed regions on the sun, from loop regions. And, um, and they get, can get quite hot and they can increase the uh, the the the, the ionization of the oxygen, so your O706 ratio goes up, and then they suddenly, they can be, be opened up by reconnection with other field lines. They can be, be opened up, and that uh, hot plasma from, or heated plasma from the closed loops is suddenly released into the slow solar wind. So you get a, a, a sort of puff of, um, of um, high ionization state um, solar wind in, in your slow solar wind. Um, so you're asking, you're asking a very fundamental question there, and uh, what's what's the origin of the slow and fast solar wind, and, and why is why is it reflected in these charge states and also composition? Um, so there's a lot of theory going on, but I'm trying to understand that. Um, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> I don't have a, a full answer for that. Um, the other one was the tilt of the, I didn't quite catch the first one. Um, yeah, I think she's referring to whether, uh, um the sp sp speed change uh with latitude i think perhaps the plot yeah. we were showing from ulysses i think uh, this one here yeah yeah oh. she's uh um, yeah yeah she's oh, asking yeah. whether the speed would change with latitude and uh and um yeah. Well, um, that that's the question, and about yeah. reverse shocks at low latitudes. But uh, I don't understand exactly. But perhaps is referring to the speed change with latitude. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I mean, it's kind of very tight. This is the sort of a typical solar minimum. So, but you're you're you 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 got to write out the details of the. Of the, of the coronal hole structure and so on, exactly how you get the shocks formed at low latitudes and so on, and, and, and what their configuration is. Um, the Ulysses period here is actually very, very simple, where you got these dominant um, north and south polar coronal holes. But actually, during the last sort of minimum, there are a lot of these equatorial coronal holes, and the structure was probably going to be a bit different um, for this sort of minimum. So it, it, it varies. From event to event, I'd say, you know, depending on what the coronal hole structure is, exactly what, where the shocks are formed and what their orientation is, and so on, whether they're formed at low latitude and so on. Um, that's I'm trying to answer the question. Thank you. I, I have one further question on the recent results uh, about from the Parker Solar Probe, where the the probe is uh, moving backward. That was uh, an interesting result you showed. And yeah. I just wanted you to uh, uh, yeah, yeah right. one of the... so what what is the orbital we're the right hand side picture is uh, top view right of the yeah that's view. right yeah yeah so the the move what is the direction of movement of the Parkinson probe orbit in okay. this case right. going along this way okay when it gets. Yeah, but it gets close to the sun. It's actually going. Um, so the sun, so that's it. So, so, so the sun's rotating in this direction. Mm -hmm. But Parker's going in this direction. And 
at this time here, it's actually going in, in, to, in this direction, as it were, faster than the, the sun is rotating. Okay, so it's compensating the rotation of the sun. That, that, that's right. Okay, that, yeah, that, that's what I wanted to. to Seem overcompensating. Yeah. Overcompensating. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is one of the unique uh, features of the, of the Parker orbit. It's actually going to be, at the times, it's going to be actually moving faster, as it were, than the sun is. So it can sort of hover in, hover in, uh, just about, basically hover above, above the same point on the sun for, 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 for a couple of days or something, or I'm not exactly sure what it is, but it'll, it'll sit there above, above the sun, just on the same point. Um, so rather than seeing all these spatial variations, you'll see, you'll see a temporal variation that's sort of the same point on the sun, sort of been leaving the same point on the sun. That's the hope, anyway. <laughs> is, is it a flyby on um, Mercury? Or? No, it, it does a fly by, flybys of Venus. Venus, okay. Venus, yeah. It goes out. To Meta, it does fly uh, every time it's done. It's done three, maybe three or four flybys now. Um, I, and, and every time it goes around Venus, it, it loses a bit of energy and, and, and gets closer and closer to the sun. So it's, it's unusual because most spacecraft you know, fly in, are in, in this, all, this direction. <laughs> right. I guess I guess, I guess so, so Stereo B is, is obviously different, but most of them, but, yeah. but, but Stereo, but Parker is going the opposite direction because it needs to decelerate and keep getting get closer to the sun every time it goes around Venus, it loses, loses momentum to Venus, yeah. Very interesting. Uh, uh, our colleague Joaquin Costa from MP also wants to ask his own question. Go on, Joaquin. Okay. Oh, sorry. Well, uh, well, very dense talk. Thank you very much for it. Uh, I was too. I'm, I'm too lazy to write in the chat, so let me ask you directly. <laughs> uh, okay. W one thing that I have uh, learned from your talk is. This high speed stream uh, wind is a little bit difficult to predict. Um, and uh, well, it's mostly based in this expansion rate of this magnetic field. Uh, but however, this IPS seems to me that is a more direct measurement of the density and velocity of uh, the wind near and far from the sun. Um, is this the future? I mean, or if, even if is this the possibility that we have to measure also the orientation of the magnet field? Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, IPS is an interesting topic, it's an interesting uh, technique. In fact, uh, I just showed these model rankings here. I showed this earlier on. In fact, the one that works best is actually one that's based on the IPS observations here. Um, oh, yeah. It actually predicts the uh, sort of wind yeah. structure of Earth better than anything else at the moment. Um, However, it depends on, you know, the observations are made by um, to be astronomical observatories and they're not, there's not always time available and uh, there's not always full of coverage you, and um, you've got to worry because the sun's not always in the sky at the time. You've got to have um, stations around the earth to actually um, observe the, um, so, well, you're not looking, you, you can't see the sources all the time. So you, you need several observatories around the, around the earth to do this. Yes. Get also to get the uh, you know to get different viewpoints for the whole build up a whole model. So it's actually a, quite a complicated um, method of actually of, of inferring the open structure. But there there are certainly um, ideas out there to, um, uh, to 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 do this on a routine basis, more routine basis. And and um, as I say, Bernie Jackson has really been pushing that a lot in the group in in, in Japan. So there is a lot of interest in doing that. Um, I. I would say um, even this figure here, actually, I would say the solar wind, the high speed streams are actually in some ways can be predicted quite well. Um, probably more better than uh, than um, than transients, I would say, really. You know, there's quite a good agreement here. It's not perfect, but it, it does actually capture the, some of the main structures in the solar wind. Um, and there's still development of this process. So um, uh, and part of it, part of the problem is that you're using um, magnetic field maps of the sun and you're doing them from the Earth usually, um, sometimes from a spacecraft. And of course, you only when you, when the uh, you, you can't see what's happening on the far side of the sun. And so you're you're if you're using your maps or some parts of your maps are going to be even up to 27 or only um, um, half a rotation um, out of date. So when you're trying to build up a global picture of the solar wind, some of your magnetograms are going to be out of date. And they won't reflect the evolution on the sun that could influence the modeling. So, um, so that's one of the limitations on modeling: um, the the age of the magnetograms that you're using. 
Um, for example, you might have um, you've got solar wind coming around the eastern hemisphere, you know, just coming around the sun on the eastern side, but the magnetic ground for that area region is probably, is probably uh, taken um, you know, 14 days earlier when the that same region of the sun was just going around the western hemisphere, western limb. Um, yeah, so that's one of the big limitations in there. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, I think now uh, Luis Eduardo Vieira, our colleague at IMPE, also wants to ask his own question. Okay. Go on, Luis. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation. Okay, you're I, I, have a I have a question about a slide that you show. You compare the steady way and B to windy in a small scale. I uh, saw you, as, a, as far as I understood, there is some structuring. Uh, even in small scale, no? Yeah, so this, is, this is the figure here? Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I'm uh, wondering what would be the best position of an observatory to study the coupling between the magnetosphere and the solar wind? I, I, I guess that the observatory at, at the L1 may not be the best one located, no? Um. Depends what you're um, going to do with something. Yeah, I mean, that's um, in terms of um, co rotating events, actually. And the idea, one idea is actually you can have a, a spacecraft to the east of the Earth, for example, at L5. He's got L5 and forming L5, I think this. Um, so that you actually can measure the uh, high speed strings before they arrive at the Earth. And in fact, this is what part of this idea of this study is can you? Can you um, forecast the structure of a CIR Earth based on observations, say, from a spacecraft that's over to, the, like, Sphero B, B here, which is over to the east? Of the, so, it's, it's, so it's observing the uh, CIR before it actually gets to the Earth. And part of this type of study is to say, well, you sort of can, but it doesn't. You don't get precisely the same structure of the two spacecrafts. So, there, so, um, um, so, so that's so. In terms of um, say for correcting events, probably you need something out to the east. If you're looking at transit events coming out from the sun, CIRs and so uh, ICMEs, then um, you need something along more along the uh, sun Earth line. Yes, and um, of course, we have L1, but try and get something that's <laughs> could be close to the sun, which has some issues in terms of uh, orbital dynamics and stuff. But um, uh, that would be like, ideal. You have something a bit closer, but of course you don't want to get too far away because you get too far away from the Earth, then the measurements you're making aren't necessarily going to be re reflected. It may not be accurate. Give, give accurate reflection for solar winds actually hitting this, the Earth. So um, you've got a sort of sweet point between going far enough away to get a good warning versus not going too far away that you your observations aren't that much use for predicting the solar yes. wind at the Earth. I, I, I may I have you other question, okay. if you don't mind. I'm, yeah, I'm okay. wondering about the, about the source of the these high speed streams. No, may we say that it's a continuous flow or a, a set of bubbles flying into this? Um, I say for um, for high speed flow, it's. Um, yeah, continuous, I would say. Um, now, of course, there is the evolution of the high speed flow of the coronal holes and so on. So, in that sense, it's sort of transient, but on longer scales. But if you talk about the lowest, lowest the slow solar wind, then that's an interesting question. There, there could actually be more of a bubbly structure. There, there are um, people who have talked about um, periodic density sort of variations in the slow solar wind. There might be evidence for a sort of um, bubbles of plasma beam so continuously released, perhaps released from these lo loops that are opening up um, yes. the sun. Um, so that has a lot, may have a little, much more in the homogeneous, homogeneous structure in the, in the slow solar wind. Um, it's still not, not something we're too clear about, I would say. Um, but yeah, high speed streams, yeah. I would say, they're crazy. For, I'd say they're continuous, basically. My continuous flow. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. So I think we, we're we out of questions now. And um, I with that, I would like to um, thank again uh, the audience for uh, being here. But most importantly, uh, on behalf of IMPI, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Richardson for presenting this excellent talk 
um, on this very interesting subject that interests a lot here. And uh, so thank you very much on behalf of INPI and on our uh, space geophysics postgraduate program and on our research in heliophysics project. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you for the invitation. Thanks for the nice comments. I was just looked in the chat here and see this. And well, thank you very much. Okay, okay, well, hopefully maybe we'll meet in person one day, maybe. <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. I hope uh, you were already invited to come and visit us when uh, 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 conditions are, are improved. Okay. Yes, so, I hope I can thank, thank you. Okay. Then. Thank you very much. Yeah. Stay, uh, uh, everyone, stay safe at home and. Uh, as most uh, um, the um, more uh, most as possible. Okay, so I second bye. that. <laughs> okay, thanks. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.